slides from a few weeks ago. Actually, I think we're back all the way back to week three. So we kind of broke these methods down in these slides. So what do we call the part, the incoming information in brackets that our method needs? I'll probably ask you this again on your final exam. And I'm going to use this term as we go throughout the course. So it's something when I use this word, I'm going to use it every week. I don't want you scratching your head wondering what does it mean. So what's the correct, somebody who got question five correct, what, what, what answer did you put? Attributes. Uh, nope, they're not attributes. <laughs> yeah, so these are parameters or arguments. I, I wrote it down, these are parameters okay. attributes. So when we use the word argument, which is in our slide here, or parameters. So those are incoming values that our method needs in order to execute. And I'll ask you this question again and refer to this term regularly. Um, the next question, question six people did well on. Question seven was a bit of a concern. Actually, let me pull up. I can actually open up the assignment, the test here, so we can look at it. So this question here, I'd say only about a quarter of the class got question seven right. <laughs> Can anybody explain what the correct answer is for question seven and why? I mean, it's just lack of logical thinking in my, uh, in my case. I didn't think it through. Okay, so what's, what's the proper answer here? I basically got two answers, but three quarters of the class said the answer was 11, and about a quarter of the class said the answer was 16. 16 is correct. Why is 16 the right answer, not 11? Okay, so Max, can you explain that a bit more? Well, the um, additions after the um, division, so it's bed mass, you go brackets, you know, exponent, and then division. Right, so you divide B by C, and then you add the result of that. Thank you. So when we're performing math operations, just like back in elementary school, right, division and multiplication operations happen first. So the first thing that happens is we divide 12 by 2, and we get 6. And then we add 10 to 6, so our answer is 16. In order for 11 to be the right answer, we would need brackets around that part. Yes, sir, I put it in the wrong place. In this case, our answer would now be 11. First, we're adding A and B, and then we're dividing by 2. And yes, I realize this isn't a math course, but when we're programming, we're going to have to perform frequently basic mathematical calculations, being able to total things, take averages, do these kinds of calculations. So here would be a very common one where we have to do a multiplication and then an addition. Frequently, we're figuring out the taxes on something, on a shopping application, an e-commerce application. We've got to do a multiplication to get the amount of tax, and then we have to add the tax on to the subtotal to get the grand total. So we need to understand the order of the operation. They all learned this in elementary school. All the same rules still apply. Brackets, division, multiplication, first, addition, subtraction, second. And for our last one, now there were a few different ways to kind of answer this one correctly. There were a few different ways you could fix this. Um, there's one glaring error in here. Anybody want to explain what the problem is with this code? Several people said, well, you can't call a second method from within the first method. That's not true. 
We can call one method from another. So that's not our problem. Okay, well, that's one problem. If this value is a double, meaning a number with decimals, and this value is an integer, meaning a whole number without decimals, if we try to perform a math operation on them in C sharp, our code editor is going to complain. It's going to say they're not the same type of number. So they have the, the two data types have to be the same if we want to do a calculation with them. That's one problem. What's the other problem? Uh, first, we don't call it private function void. Uh, yeah, that's another problem. So the word void is supposed to appear here. So what the method returns, void meaning nothing, that's supposed to come... Uh, we don't need the word function, basically. Well, no, we do need the word function, but... The word's about it. Fact is to have it in there. There's one other obvious problem. So what the function returns should appear before the word function. Again, if we go back and look at our structure, something like this. There's one other problem with our numbers. What's wrong with this number being represented in this parameter? What kind of number is this? A double or an integer? It's a double. Yet, what is the second parameter type in this function? What's it expecting? It's expecting an integer. So this method is expecting two numbers. Yet yeah, this, and it's saying this number has to be a whole number, yet this code is trying to pass in a number with decimals instead into this second place. So that's going to generate an error. This method is asking for an integer as the second number. So the way we would fix this, well, one way to fix it is we would have to change this to accept a number that takes decimals. And this would also have to be a double. If we're doing math with two numbers of double type, the result is also going to be a double type. Should we convert it into an integer? <laughs> Unless we do a conversion. Conversion in the method declarate, in the so arguments. There, the conversion is. Yeah, we could do it there. That would be the other option. Would be to change that. We'd have to take the decimal away. Or if you converted it, it's going to ignore the decimal. So on your test, where you did lose marks, I tried to make some comments as to where and why, so your mark shouldn't be a big mystery. Okay. If you have other questions about your test, you're free to come see me this week during office hours, and we can talk about it. Does anybody have any questions about any, anything else on the test that you want to address right now? Okay, I want to have a quick look at assignment one. I'm going to show you a sample of how it should run. So here was my, my six inputs and my button. and I kind of tested everybody's just like this. I put in six inputs. I click calculate. I wanted to make sure that all the grades were proper. I put in nice round numbers so I could make sure that the average calculation gave me the right value. And then I tried changing some of the numbers to make sure that I got all the right grades. And each time my average kept changing. And if I put in a grade lower than 50, I made sure that set F. So that was the output I was looking for. And a lot of people, in general, this was fairly well done. Most people had output fairly similar to this, if not identical, which is great. 
Um, one comment I made to a lot of students in order to write, calculate the seven grades, you wrote the same long if statement with seven, six conditions, and you wrote that seven times, right? Which is okay, it's functional, it's not ideal. Why, if it's not ideal for a couple of reasons, why do we not want to repeat the same block of identical code seven times? Yeah, it's a lot more work if suddenly I change the rules. You don't have to just make one change in your program, you have to make that change seven times. What's the other problem with writing the same block of code seven times? Um, that's true. It does take up memory. Yeah, it takes up your time. It's slow to write the same block of code over and over again. So a few people, and I made comments congratulating you if you did it, so this part of the code was pretty much similar in everybody's. The other thing I did ask you to do in the assignment document was I asked you to name the inputs descriptively. So you may have lost a mark if you named them text one, text two, text three, text four, because it doesn't really tell someone else looking at your code what those inputs mean. So I wanted you to give them descriptive IDs, sorry, descriptive names, like I gave here. So most people manage this part fine take the values from the text boxes, store those into numeric variables. That was good. So again, we're gonna talk about writing our own methods a bit more today. Notice here how many times I have the if statements. Just once. So rather than repeating this seven times for every course, I just created a function called set grade. So set grade has three pieces. It has the value that comes in, so what the numeric grade is, 60, 65, 70. What does the word string here indicate? So my method has an input parameter or argument of an integer. Okay, so Max, what do you mean by the return type? That's right. What you want to get back from the function return. Right. So the function takes a number in and sends a letter, sends a string back. So the, the logic for all grades, it's all the same. So I take in a number and then I just evaluate. So I set my default return as F. And anytime the grade is one of these conditions, I change the grade from F to something else. And at the bottom, I send back what that letter grade is. So now I can just execute this function six times. So I pass in the Comp 1030 numeric grade, and set grade will give me a letter back, which I'll display in my label. And I call that same function each time passing in a grade for a different course and attaching the letter grade that comes back onto my label. And then lastly, I calculate the average grade and one more time call my set grade function. So this is equivalent to what most of you did. We get the same output, but this is just a lot less work. <laughs> so we never want to write 50 lines of code if we could write 10 lines of code. And also, if I have to change these rules, if suddenly the school, my school says, well, now you need to get 90 for an A. <laughs> if you have a grade in the 80s, it's not an A anymore, it's a B. All I have to do is make one change. I just change that number. That's it. Save my code, and now my function will work for all of the grades. So this is why we want to need to understand how to write our own methods and what these input parameters are and return types so that this saves us the trouble of repeating our code when we have to execute the same logic again and again. So um, I think we need to practice this a bit more so that I want to increase people's comfort level with this structure. Um, the only other thing I want to say about the test and the solution is if you're finding this really, really difficult and really struggling to understand what's happening in class, our course is about half over now, OK? 
okay? This is our introductory programming class. All the other classes we're gonna have after this semester, they're all based on the fundamentals in this class. So if you're really struggling, then what you need to do is you need to ask yourself, what am I, how am I studying in the course? If basically I come to class for th every day, every week, that's good, but if all you do is work at this stuff the three hours we're in here Monday mornings, if you're struggling to understand, then maybe you need to try some different approaches. And here are some things I would recommend. Number one, if you don't get the examples working in class, this is why I'm recording things on YouTube. The idea is you can go home, you can watch the things we're doing, and you need to work at them in Visual Studio until your examples are working. And you can stop, you can hit rewind, you can see the lessons again. In the textbook, sorry, in the syllabus, I've also recommended, there is an optional textbook. So you can go into course information, and in the syllabus, the book is not required at all. But I'll show you the name of the book. And if what we're doing in class isn't syncing in, then you need another resource. Um, sorry, wrong course. <laughs> And maybe for some people being able to read as opposed to just listening and doing, I mean, everybody learns differently. So if just coming to class isn't kind of helping things register, and my syllabus doesn't want to open. Let's try it here. So this is an introduction to programming book. There's no, it's not particular to any specific language, so you won't see examples in C-sharp, but you'll see lots of pseudocode. There's diagrams, there's visuals, and there's sample exercises that you can try in any language. You can try writing the pseudocode, or you could try the examples in C-sharp. I also have office hours every week. Then maybe what you need to do is start coming to office hours each week with specific questions as to what you didn't understand about that lesson or what you can't get working. So there's there's also, uh, you can also go to student services, which is downstairs in B building, and you can ask for a peer tutor in this class. So many second year students, both in web and computer programmer, they've taken this course before, and one of them can be assigned to tutor you for a few hours a week to help you catch up. These are usually students who are doing really well and are very strong in programming. Okay, it's free to you, there's no cost. It's included. So these are all things available to you if you're struggling. So if what you're doing is not working and you feel you're really behind and that things are just getting more difficult, then I encourage you, use me, use peer tutors, use a textbook, use the resources, but you need to try to change your approach. So if you got, say, less than 10 out of 17 on the test, then you need to look at doing some of these things because I don't want anybody to fall too much farther behind. Okay, the course isn't going to get easier as we move forward. It's only going to get more challenging. Okay, so the book is here uh, in the syllabus. As I said, I believe it's available in the bookstore on campus. Question? No? Okay. So this week, my original plan was that we were going to Go ahead and talk about loops that may get pushed either to the last hour of class or possibly even till next week. Because I think we need to do some more practice with decision structures and particularly with creating our own methods. So here's what I'd like you to do. Here's your, here's your kind of a warm up task. And how easily or how challenging you find this should probably give you a good idea as to maybe 
let you do an honest self-assessment as to where you are in the course and with the concepts we're doing. Okay. So I want you to open up Visual Studio, create a new solution for today. You can call it week seven or lesson seven. And on the form that Visual Studio will create, I want you to put on two text boxes and a button. Everybody knows how to do this. I've marked everyone's assignment. Designing user interfaces is something by now people are getting pretty good at. So your inputs, the first box will be for somebody to enter their name. And the second box is going to be for somebody to enter the year they were born. And when the user clicks a button, you need to create a method. You call the method whatever you want. The method will have one input parameter, and that is the value of the year. So what data type will that be for a year? It would be a string, a double, an integer, a date. What data type would you use to hold a year? Yeah, it would be an integer. It's going to be a whole number with no decimals. So your method is going to have a parameter. That's an INT32, and it's going to have a return type of INT32 as well. So the method will take the year in, it will send a number out. And here's what the method has to figure out. The method has to figure out how old you are <laughs> based on the year you put in. So if you put in the year 2000 as your year of birth, the method's going to send back 16. And then you have to display on a label this message. So the name from that input, comma, you are, and then how many years old has been calculated in your function. So I want you to do this on your own right now. You can ask for help, but this is practice for you.
Four years is oh, called leave okay. right when the 366 days. So you could put in, also put on a message saying whether you were born in a leap year or you were not born in a leap year. So use your Google Foo and <laughs> see if you can find how to do it. You get it working quickly. Okay. So you'll need two methods in your C-sharp code. One that you create that calculates the age, and then the button-click method that executes your method. to ask for help. It's not a test. It's just a review. Input parameter is the year that we 
it's then back to the So what, so the return type can be changed instead of sending back to the We'll accept the year and we'll send back an age. So they're both going to be. Well, that's going to happen at the very end. So the first thing you need to do is get the two endpoints, right, like you did in your assignment. Uh -huh. So you need to get the year, put it in a variable, get the name, put it in a variable. And then you need to write a function that will calculate the age based on that. In this case, we won't use them for the name. What type of data is the name? I have string. Right, so it's a string name equals, and then the text properties or text box, right? Whatever the user's type in the text box, we're going to then put it here. so I can see it. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, it's not the right type of project. Just we created a different kind of project. Yeah, this is not a Windows form application. This is a this is a Windows phone application, I think. Yeah, what we want is that we okay, we don't want that. What we want we're using Windows in this course. We're always going to go develop Windows. No, because it's a different template altogether. It's a completely different project template from what we're using. I've never used that. Oh, so okay. I, yeah. okay.
Okay. Okay. I'll draw it out for you on paper. This goes to a variable, and this goes to a variable. Then you need to take this variable, so you can call that one here, call that one name. And then here you have a function, a method of something like get age. This function will need one value, right? What value will we need in order to calculate somebody's age? Which of these two values do we need? Right, so that's going to be an input parameter. That's a piece of information our function, our method needs. What type of data is this? A whole number, a decimal, text, date. Right, so it's an integer. 32, right? That's going to be passed into our function. So now how are we going to calculate, so let's call this x for example. So how would we calculate, if we know the year you were born, how would we calculate your age? No. How would we know based on 1987 how old you are? Yeah. So what kind of calculation would we have to perform in order to figure out your age? What year is it now? Okay, so what would we do with 2016 and 1997 to figure your age? It's 2016. We were born in 1997. How are you going to figure out how old you are with those two numbers? Right. So that's what our function has to do. 2016. X, right? That will give you some other number. Yeah. Now we want our function to send this value, that's the result. We want it to send this back over here. So now we can display it. So now we can display it. So our function takes a number in, right, this year, and it sends another number back. So this function returns a number as well. It takes one number in, and sends another number back. Okay, well, mouse, put your mouse over it. Okay, that's actually fine. You're actually fine, except one problem. This is not why you're getting an error, but just move them. So, this function needs an input parameter, right? It needs a value coming in. Yeah. Which value do we need coming in? Why uh, in your text box? Right, so it needs a parameter. Just go back. Right? It needs a parameter here that's an integer. Oh. Right? Because in order for our function to run, we have to pass in one value that's an integer. Like Ryan, here was my code in the assignment, right? Here was my function where I accepted in an integer of a grade, and then I did my logic and I sent back a letter grade. Okay. Okay. So we're doing something similar. We're taking a number in, except in our function, we're going to send a number back. I'm still getting that red line. Up. Okay, you will, because what it's saying is. Read what it says. Does it say, read what the message says? No, code pass, return a value. 
Okay, because it says your function is returning or sending back something, you just haven't written it. It will say that until you've written this line at the end. Oh, right. You have to say return whatever the value you're calculating and sending back is. Oh. Once you have that, that error goes away. Oh. So that's fine. It just means your code's not complete. And there was one more actually. Okay. Um, I was trying to go by this, and I noticed that the and then the thing, but I didn't know quite what to do. Okay. It's so this function isn't going to display anything. All it's going to do is send back this. Right. So here also. Your variable name should be different from the name of the function. Oh. Yeah. So you may just want to call this variable age. And now you just need to return that variable. Yeah, you just need to spell return correctly. Oh. Space age and a semicolon. So now this red goes away. Oh. Right. So this function takes a year in, does a calculation with it, and sends back the age. So now you need to execute this function by calling get age. Again, I'll show you the example to do with the in a minute action. Okay. So here I've set up my function. Takes a grade in, sends a string back. Here I'm calling or executing that function each time, right? Where I pass in a value and then I display the result of the function. I can pass you. We don't need to do the convert because that's already, they're both strings. Okay, so this is good. So now you just need to return that variable. You just need the keyword return. Okay. And then your variable. Okay. All right, so we take the year in, we calculate, and then we send back the word return. That means send back. Nope. Yeah, so return to base result. Right. Now, also, this function, you have it inside of this one. It can't go inside. You have to move this function down here. Um, let's think about which variable we need to go back to form. You have two variables, right? One for name and one for year. So we need to get both inputs. Name is a string already, so we don't need to convert anything. Good job to do a conversion on that number. Yeah. Because by default, anything in a text box is a string. So if you're going to store it in a string, there's no need to do a conversion that's already in the right data type. But if the variable you want is going in a text box, it's any the variable, anything other than a string, you'll have to convert. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay, so the first thing you need to do is you need to get the two values from your text boxes and put them in variables. So we have two variables, one for name and one for year. What type will the name be? Will it be, is it text, is it a number? What type of data is the name? Right, so we use a string. Take out the word private. You're going to have the word string. 
and then create a variable called name equal yeah, no string name equals and now how do we get it from the first text box the name of your text box your form, click on the name box, we call the text box one. How do we finish each command? There's a certain character that has to go through the line. Right. Okay. So that will take whatever is typed in here and store it there. Now you need to do the same thing with the year, but year is not going to be a string. It's a different type of data. Back to the question. I'm just going to the Okay, the problem is I think you put some of your code, all your code has to scroll up a bit. <laughs> problem is you have some curly, extra curly brackets here, I think. Yeah, so you've written this method inside of the click method. <laughs> this has to go after one of those curly braces. You've put one function inside another one. First thing you need to do is get the two inputs from the text boxes and store them in variables. Okay, we need to know the name that was entered, and we want to know the birth year that was entered. That's going to be step one. The user's typing in something, and we need two variables. We need to take the text of each text box and store it in a variable when the user clicks the button. So that will be similar to what I did here. But you have to modify it a little bit. Take the text and put it into a variable for both the name and the year. That's step one. challenge. I want you to also display whether the year they were born is a leap year where there's an extra day. So I would say you were born in a leap year or you were not born in a leap year. Okay, so you have to do a little research online to figure that out. Looks good. Try that. Wow, oh, you're old, Raj. Right? 1991. So you're on the right. You're on the right track, but obviously it's not quite correct. Oh, okay. Right, because it's not showing when you were born. It's supposed to show how old oh, you are. Okay. Oh, yeah. It's saying you're on 2000. Years. You look good for 1900 years old. <laughs> So this is, this is good, but there's no semicolon here. You need the curly brackets that open and close your method. And then you need to write the calculation inside. 
No, it's one command. Yeah. So we're doing a bunch of yeah. so we're taking that input, converting it to a number, and storing it in that yeah. So it's yeah, when you put it on another line, yeah. it doesn't it doesn't recognize that it's one yeah. one command. So now you want to do the same thing with you with the name, but you don't have to convert name because name is already going to be yeah. string. How is there a question? Okay, so run and see what happens. It works. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so well that's a start, but now we need to find the calculate the age. <coughs> when in year, how are we gonna do what is year someone was born? How would we calculate their age? What math do we do to you know how old they are? Yeah, so would you add, subtract, right? So you need a function that subtracts the year. Well, first of all, you need another value to equal to the year. And then you need to subtract that from 2016 and display that in a message. Well, yeah, we'll use this. You don't need the age variable, your function will return the age. Okay, so now you need a calculation here. 2016 minus year, like age equals. You're saying return age, but you haven't given age about age should be the result of that calculation. Okay, so you're on the right track. Okay, so your code, it all works, I can tell. But what I want you to do, rather than doing the calculation in here, that part I want you to break out into a separate function. Okay. Where a number's passed in, the year or here, and it sends back the age. Okay, kind of like the function I've written here. Yeah. A value comes in, processing is done, and then a different value is Right? So I want your code to be modular like this in case we had multiple functions to return ages. It's about 10 after 9, so I'm going to suggest that we take a pause here. And I think what we'll do, because we went much later than usual, is we'll just take one longer break today. We'll take a break until 9.30, and then we'll just have one long break, and then we can go for an hour and we come back. Just give me one second.